And by now, for See It Now with Edward R. Murrow, which originates in Studio 41 in New York City. Edward R. Murrow in See It Now, a document for television based on the week's news and told through the actual voices and faces that made the news. Now speaking to you from the actual control room of Studio 41 is the editor of See It Now, Edward R. Murrow. Good evening. We are 10 years late with this story. But this week, our cameras were permitted to visit what might be called the birthplace of the atomic age. It was a most unusual cradle. The event occurred on December 2nd, 1942. And the cradle was under the stadium at a football field. The rest of our lives will be spent under the combined threat and promise of nuclear energy. Our nation was the first to get the atomic bomb, but it was not an all-American production, as we shall shortly see. Ed, this is Stagg Field, Ellis Avenue, on Chicago's south side. Although that parapet looks more as if the catapult or the crossbow was invented here, it was here that the atomic age tiptoed in on December 2, 1942. Ten years ago today, to the casual observer, it was an abandoned relic, except for a faculty squash court below the stand. This is where the University of Chicago won Big Ten football championships before they gave up the big time. Here it was that they stopped Red Grange, and Five Yard McCarthy made history. Then, as now, the stands were covered with tar paper, with an occasional weed growing and even a tree. But a careful observer might have noticed air-conditioned ducts sticking up where the choice seats used to be. This air was sucked in, cooled, and blown down through ducts several floors below to the old squash court. We entered by way of the same elevator that used to carry the uranium and graphite down to the first pile. Some of the balconies are now gone, but insofar as was possible, we asked all of the original team that could be assembled to stand where they stood 10 years ago. At the time of the original experiment, Herbert Anderson was 28. He is now one of the top physicists in the country. Next, Walter Zinn, head of the Argonne National Laboratory. Samuel K. Allison, one of the key men here 10 years ago, later helped run the experiment at Alamogordo. Leo Zillard, who helped get FDR's interest in the bomb. Leona Marshall, the only woman on the project. Enrico Fermi, Nobel Prize winner. His was the original discovery. Arthur Compton, another Nobel Prize winner. My name is Herbert Anderson. I came from Columbia University in New York City to build this pile. I was here on December 2nd to see whether the pile worked. The pile, which was constructed in this space behind me, was literally a pile of graphite bricks and uranium. As a matter of fact, we have here a number of the bricks which we used in the construction of that pile and I thought you might like to see one or two of them. Here's one of those graphite bricks. We pile these up here. Some of these graphite bricks had holes drilled in them in which were put the uranium cylinders, and then other bricks were placed and stacked one on top of the other until we reached a structure that went way up to the ceiling there. It was really an enormous pile of graphite and uranium cylinders and covered the whole area which is marked out by this white line. We have a sketch here showing how the pile looked when it was finished. Here are the graphite bricks which were piled up to form this large chain reacting structure. These are the cadmium control rods which were used to hold the chain reaction in check until we were ready to try it. This structure is an elevator on which the graphite was lifted into position and then transferred to the level at which the graphite bricks were to be stacked. 
I'm Arthur Compton. I was, I suppose, the straw boss of this project. It was my task to find a place for the scientists who knew what could be done with an atomic reaction, find a place for them to do their job. We found the place in the laboratory in which you were standing here at the University of Chicago. That was the beginning. From that time on, we had the atomic program going. We went to see some of the people that you will be seeing here today. Enrico Fermi, Wigner, Ernest Lawrence, and many others, Harold Urey. As a result of many discussions of this kind, we came to a, uh, we formed a report, turned it into Van Ever Bush of the Office of Scientific Research and Development. The report said, yes, you can probably make an atomic bomb, and it'll be terribly destructive so destructive that the people who get it first may very probably win a victory as a result of it. We are in a race with Germany. The results in terms of years, three years and a half, three or four years. In terms of dollars, something of the order of a billion. That's what it was going to cost. It happened that a report of a similar type had come in from the British at about the same time. Then Eva Bush took the reports to the president. And the president came back, you must go ahead. We can't afford to run the chance that the Germans will get there first, for it might mean that they would snatch victory out of defeat. We just can't afford to let them go, uh, to let them go and not press this task ourselves. And so on December 6, the day before Pearl Harbor, a group of us were brought together at Washington and given our assignments. Harold Urey, Ernest Lawrence, E.V. Murphy. They were assigned with the task of separating the uranium isotopes. They turned to me and said, will you see how you can make an atomic bomb after you have the uranium isotopes separated? On December 2nd of 1942, the reviewing committee set up under the auspices of the Army, came here as the last stage of its investigation to make one more look. They were in my office over here across the campus. And in that office, they asked, where is Fermi? Fermi, you know, the great Italian physicist who had done so much in connection with neutrons. I told them, Fermi asked to be excused today. He's busy over in the laboratory with an experiment. And so I started to answer their questions. We'd been at it for half a day. And the telephone rang. They're ready to try the crucial experiment. I knew what they meant. We picked the youngest man of that reviewing committee, happened to be Crawford Greenewald, now the president of DuPont but then a young research man who had been heading some of DuPont's important research developments. He and I came across the campus. We came into the room in which I'm now sitting, into a balcony over there, and we saw the pile of graphite and uranium blocks piled here where I'm sitting now. They had tried some preliminary experiments. Now they were set to try the final one. I recall Fermi's instructions to, to uh, Walter Zinn, pull out the control rod and number, another foot. On the basis of the earlier experiments, we knew that now was the showdown. If we were going to have a chain reaction, it would come at this time. And you could hear the counters that recorded the radiation beginning to click. And they clicked faster and faster until they became a rattle. And then you could begin to see the spot on the galvanometer move across the scale. And as it moved faster and faster, it got to the middle of the scale, and Fermi said, throw in the control rods. The control rods went in, and the spot of light moved back toward zero. That was the evidence that a chain reaction, the release of atomic energy, had been affected, controlled, and brought back again to, to zero. A little chair right up. I remember the grin that was on Fermi's face as he said, well, boys, that's that. Somebody pulled out a bottle of Italian wine, a little, uh, and everyone was pleased.
But most of all, I remember the expression on the faces of some of these men. That was Enrico's face, Fermi's face, that is. Cool and collected. And there's Leo Zillard. He was troubled about the international repercussions, what all that would mean. And then there was Volney Wilson. It was he who had called me on the phone and invited me to come on over here. Volley had turned in a report of more than a year before, indicating the possibility of the atomic reaction. But he said, please take me off of this. I don't want to have anything to do with something that's so destructive. So we put him on radar. But after Pearl Harbor, he had come around to me and said, I want to get back and do my part on that, uh, that atomic task. But best of all, I remember the face of Crawford Greenwald. His face was aglow. He had seen a miracle. No less than a miracle that was opening the dawn of a new era. And as we walked back across the campus to that reviewing committee, Crawford was telling me what he was thinking of. New sources of power to turn the wheels of industry. New methods for use in science. New possibilities as yet undreamed of. From there on, the story is well known. It's a, it's a matter of history. Well, as I come back to this room, it's a good many years since I was in here last. I see here on the floor, marked up, where that 30-foot pile of black blocks of graphite and uranium were, brings back a certain nostalgia. Next, Enrico Fermi. Had he not fled from Mussolini's fascism, the enemy might have had the bomb ahead of us. My name is Enrico Fermi. I was born in Rome. On December 2nd, 1942, I was directing this show, which means that I could not have done a thing without the help of the rest of the boys and girls. This room looks now very different from what it did, it did 10 years ago. None of this scaffolding was there. The room was uh, somewhat bigger. The ceiling was higher. On that particular day, uh, we all assembled on a balcony that looked uh, somehow like the one that I'm, I'm on now. Uh, in spite of some similarity between the working of a pile and the working of an atomic bomb, there are few instruments or experiments in physics that move so slowly as did uh, the reaction in that particular machine. This, of course, was uh, desirable and planned. We did not want to have an explosion, an explosion nor even a remote possibility of an explosion. Actually, the reaction went on so slowly that uh, uh, people sort of watched the instruments rise barely perceptibly, and only by some amount of calculation could we at the end say that the self-sustaining chain reaction had been achieved. Now, there were some uh, precautions being taken. There was uh, a control rod named ZIP that was manipulated by Zinn and by Hilbery that would just be drawn uh, by gravity into the structure if that had, been, had become necessary. And uh, after some hours of uh, approaching very carefully the reacting point, we passed the reacting point very barely, uh, just barely, and the reaction began to increase and to increase faster and faster. And if we had allowed it to go on all through the night, eventually it would have reached an extremely high intensity. But of course, after some reasonable time, we dumped in again the control rods uh, and the intensity suddenly went down. I am Leona Marshall of the University of Chicago. During the time when the pile was being built, we followed the increasing radioactivity with counters, and from these measurements, made an estimate of the expected rise in activity of the pile at startup. I am Leo Zilaj. I was born in Hungary 54 years ago. In 1939, together with Enrico Fermi, 
I dreamt up a chain reacting system composed of graphite and uranium. On December 2nd, 1942, I was here to see it work. On that day, my only function was to say, I told you so. I remember when it all was over, and everybody has left except Fermi. I shook hands with Fermi and said, I believe this will go down as a black day in the history of mankind. My name is Samuel Allison. I was born in Chicago, right about half a mile from this spot. What did I do on the project? Well, at various times, I did various things. At one time, I piled graphite. At another time, I was in charge of some chemists. And then again, I was in charge of some fish experts who were trying to find out if we were going to damage the salmon in the Columbia River. It's too bad Al Graves isn't here. He couldn't get here from Los Alamos. If he were here, he ought to be up there on a platform showing what he did when the chain reaction was started. Up there, there was a jar of cadmium solution. And that jar was up there at the time the chain reaction was started on December 2nd, 1942. Now cadmium is just poison to the chain reaction. It puts out the chain reaction like water puts out fire. And uh, we thought that uh, if everything else failed, we could have somebody up there with some cadmium in solution so that the solution could be spilled or poured over the structure and stop the reaction. We're awfully glad that we didn't have to do this because it would have ruined the graphite and the structure uh, for all future use. I'm Walter Zim. I was here in December 1942 when the chain reaction first operated. My job at that time was to coordinate the various groups who were putting together the uranium and graphite which made up the pile. My name's Tom Burrow. I also worked on controls. At the time of the experiment, I was 22. I'm still with the Argonne Laboratory. After the experiment succeeded, a toast was drunk. The scientists went up to the street level. Most of them never returned to that room until this week. They carried their secret with them. But it was necessary to inform Dr. Conant at Harvard, who would relay the news to Washington. Dr. Compton did it in a most guarded telephone call. Dr. Compton said he was no actor, but he agreed to repeat it for us as a tribute to Fermi. Well, Dr. Conant, Dr. Conant, uh, Jim, this is Arthur. I thought you'd know, I thought you'd want to know that uh, uh, the Italian navigator has just landed in the New World. What's what? that? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, the natives were friendly. Everyone landed safe and happy. You want to know the next news, we'll get that on to you as soon as we can. Well, that's all today. Arthur Compton is now president of Washington University in St. Louis. That was his private way of stating what a bronze plaque now tells on the exterior of Stag Field. On December 2, 1942, man achieved here the first self-sustaining chain reaction and thereby initiated the controlled release of nuclear energy. Fermi and Szilard were only two of many foreigners who contributed to this project. American science is not omniscient, nor is it self-sufficient. Power is never absolute. It depends upon progress, and traditionally, American scientists have welcomed the initiative, the brains, the experience of their foreign colleagues. Today, under what is called the McCarran Immigration Act, it is quite possible that neither Fermi nor Szilard would be permitted to enter this country. Scores of scientists have been refused permission to come here, scores of non-communist scientists. This is not in the American tradition. There is a little known quotation from a man called Adolf Hitler, who once said, the great strength of a totalitarian state is that it will force those who fear it to imitate it.